All right, well, we, uh, we are in part four, and uh, I had my father-in-law in town the last couple weeks, so uh, I, don't want to, um, I don't want you to forget where we left off. So I'm just going to give you just a quick review. First of all, we talked about just uh, reaching people for Christ just one person at a time. I gave you kind of a, a basic outline. I mentioned that part one, which comprised of three messages, deals with the man. Part two is dealing with the mission, and that's where we are today. And part three is dealing with the method. Uh, the man, the preparations of the individual who is to go out and disseminate the gospel, that's very, very important. Uh, the mission itself is critical, knowing what it is we're supposed to be taking to other people. And then part three is how we're going to take it to them. Okay, So that's essentially the three basic uh, parts. I mentioned, first of all, uh, in the message uh, dealing with the man about having a clear head, having a clear head, and, and that's so important. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gotten stuffy or, or dizzy. I've been feeling dizzy lately, not sure what the deal is, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just kind of are foggy, like outside. Matter of fact, you're kind of foggy, right? And, uh, boy, there are some times you wake up and you've had just a really refreshing night's sleep and you've had a really clear head, Right? And, uh, and then there's maybe some mornings you wake up and it's not so clear. Well, having a clear head is just a, a wonderful joy. And uh, when we talk about the gospel message, having a clear head is important. Knowing what we're out there to preach and, uh, and knowing that we have eternity at stake. So having a clear head, I mentioned part two was having a caring heart. If you want to reach people with the gospel, you got to care about them. If there are lost people out there that need to be saved, you got to care about them if you want to reach them. It's just true. If you don't care about people, you'll never reach them. So, having a caring heart. The last time we were together, we talked about having clean hands, right? So, having a clear head, having a caring heart, and having clean hands was last message, three weeks ago. And uh, this deals with the topic of purity, and there are so many times that our impurities become a, a, a hindrance, a, a, a testimonial hindrance where we can't go out there and preach the gospel to people because we're not living right. So we have to live right for the Lord. We have to live right. We don't have to live right for the Lord in order to be saved. But in order to be a good testimony to people, we got to live right. To have blessings showered upon us from God, we have to live right. So there is a benefit to living right, having these clean hands. Well, this morning, I'm going to get into, uh, I'm calling it part four, but it's, it's kind of like an introduction, and it'll be a little bit shorter message. We have communion today, and I'm not going to miss it this time. And uh, you wouldn't believe how many times we prepare communion, and we don't get to communion. And then my kids go to the back, and they empty all the little, the little gra- it's just grape juice. We don't do wine, but they empty all the grape juice into the, into the big cup, and they drink all the grape juice. And uh, they, they don't mind us when we don't do communion because they benefit from the grape juice. So anyway, so uh, we're going to try to do that as well. So this is, uh, this is part four, and I'm just kind of titling it kind of Introduction to the Great Commission. Introduction to the Great Commission. So by way of introduction, there are many different ways to approach the topic of the Great Commission. But I figured I would, uh, I would start with addressing the problem that Jesus himself saw. Now, up into chapter 9, to Matthew chapter 9, up into this point, he had been doing uh, miracles, wonderful workings throughout all the region of Judea, and he'd been healing and so on and so forth. And, and the reason he had been doing these miracles was to prove that he was, in fact, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God that came to this earth to die for sin. And so he was on a mission, though. Jesus was on a mission. He was, uh, he was tasked by God to do a certain work. And when we get to John chapter 4, 34, we see this work. He says in John 4, 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So in a sense, Jesus' work was to finish the work that God had for him to do. So he was, in a sense, a co-laborer. He wanted to, to, uh, to do something, and this something was to, to bring this, uh, the gospel message to the community of Israel, to Jerusalem, and to the world. Okay? 
In John 9, 4, he said this. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So what Jesus is saying then is, is that there is a, only a certain amount of time to go out and to preach the gospel, for the, to, to bring the world this wonderful message. Because there's going to come a time when there won't be any time. And I don't know when I, every, every day I wake up and get a little bit older, I'm not as old as Jeff, obviously, and he's not in here, he's out there, probably lurking around with his God. No, he's probably not doing that, but anyway, he, um, I'm not as old as him, but I am older than Ben, and I tell you, when I wake up in the morning, sometimes I feel aches and pains, and I know that there's going to come a time when I can't do the things that I would normally do. Now, my body tells me that my mind is not so sharp yet. Because my mind will tell me at times, oh, you can still do that. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have done that before where you have tried to physically do a task that your body is just not, you know, listening to you, to you right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, here it is. Jesus has this, own, this time frame, this little bit of time that he has to work because there's going to come a time when he won't be able to work any longer. And I'd like to just challenge you this morning to remember that. I would like to challenge you this morning with this idea that there will come a time when you are not able to carry out the gospel message as you can right now. There might be a time that you're laid up in a hospital. Yeah, I've been there. You probably have been there at some point in time if you're older. When there will not be the opportunity for you to share the gospel like you can share right now. And we need to remember that. And so Jesus was, in a sense, burdened by this work that needed to be done. So we get to Matthew uh, chapter 9 toward the end, and we see uh, three simple verses there that I believe that we should look into this morning. And, and uh, I'm going to read just kind of one verse at a time as I go through this. But first of all, I want to say this, that Jesus was moved with compassion. In Matthew 9... Verse 36, he said this, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Let me ask you a question this morning, church. Do you feel compassion on the lost? Do you feel compassion on the lost, or do you walk by lost people uh, with, with no regard to to their eternity. There are many lost people that need the Lord. Now, it's our responsibility to help them find him. But yet at times we just tend to, tend to gloss over them, don't we? We tend to maybe walk down the street and not think about them as, uh, as people that need to know the Lord for eternity. And that's a, 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 very, uh, a very scary thing, and it's Becomes, it's becoming a whole lot more normal. We're, we're beginning to not be compassionate with people. But you see, Jesus was moved with compassion. In Psalm 145, 8 to 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and of great mercy, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. We need to have a compassion on the lost people. I don't know if you've seen people who have been physically lost before and you see them kind of just wandering around. You ever see a, a, a kid in a mall or something looking for their mom and you, your immediate heart just jumps out, doesn't it? And you see them and they're just kind of like looking around and like kind of, I've seen that before. And you're asking yourself, I bet that kid lost his parent. And you're immediately concerned. You're compassionate on them. Jesus, in a sense, felt sympathy or, or pity for the suffering of the multitudes. And they were, he says in verse 36, were, uh, were scattered abroad as, as sheep having no shepherd. They were lost. Many times we don't feel compassion on people as we ought to. Now I can say this from my personal experience that there are times in my life that I feel more compassionate with people. And then there are times that I feel less compassionate with people. And basically, it's a, it's a tolerance issue. I need to, here, boy, sons, come up here. Come up here. 
I, I need a couple. They didn't know I was going to do this. Stand over here, young man. Okay, stand over here, old man. This is Ben. He's 14 tomorrow. He can drive. And uh, it's a scary thought that he can drive, right? But I'm going to teach him. He's got a good dad to help him learn. Anyway, so I just want these gentlemen to stand up here for just a moment. And, and I want to ask you a couple questions. Are these people or not? Yes. They are people. They're human beings, aren't they? And uh, sometimes we can look at a human being, maybe a, a son, maybe we can look at a son as kind of being a, a nuisance. <laughs> at I would never say that you're a nuisance. I'm just simply saying this is just kind of sometimes what people might think is that uh, you're a nuisance or maybe a burden. Now, until they can mow the lawn and then the whole world of new opportunities. <laughs> and until they can drive on their own, then that's a whole other world. It's like, son, I need some milk from the store. And if you want to eat tomorrow, you'll drive safely to the store at an appropriate speed limit and stop at all signs, looking both ways. Anyway, so they can be a nuisance or a burden. But this is still a human being. You see what I'm saying? This over here can be a, a client or maybe a customer. Maybe if you are, uh, maybe if you are a, a, a salesman, maybe you look at this guy as saying, well, this, this guy over here, this is not a person. This is a dollar sign. And, and, and this guy, he only, he only adds value to me because he adds value to my checkbook, right? So he is a client or a customer. Or maybe when they grow up, they'll have, they'll have employees or they'll, they'll be an employer, right? And, 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 or they will be an employee, rather, not have employees because that would make them an employer. Anyway, so, so here these kids are, and they will one day grow up. They will have people work under them or they will work under someone. But they're people. And how often do we walk past kids and say, well, this is just a, a little burden. And this over here is just a, a client or he's an employee. And, and we totally take out the aspect that they're human beings. And as we walk our days, or walk through our days, and we ask ourselves, you pass by this person, and you pass by this person, and, and maybe a, a, a lady at a checkout counter, or maybe, a, maybe someone who's just casually walking down the streets. Now, I would be lying to you if I said that every person I come in contact with, I hand to heaven track to. I'd be lying to you. I would be lying to you if I said that every time that I, every time that I pass by somebody, I'm grieved for them. But let me tell you what, that should be our heart. These children, you folks, your employees, your employer, your clients and your customers, they're not burdens. They're not a liability. They're an asset. They're somebody that we can reach with the gospel message. And the problem is, is we don't have compassion on people. We don't have a heart. And Jesus said here in verse 36, and he was as, as people, as, uh, they were scattered abroad as sheep having no separate shepherd. So they were lost. And he cared about them, and he had compassion on them. And he cared for the kids. They weren't just people, or they weren't just clients. They are people. You're not just a person, son. You're my son. Anyway, go sit down. You don't have to stand up here. I was going to preach the whole message with him up here. I'm not going to do that to them. You know, it's amazing to me how, how, how far we're, we're removing ourselves from, from actual people. They're no, longer, they're no longer tangible people, are they? And how many of us just want to get away and just say, I just don't want to be with, with anybody, any people anymore. But the people is the ministry. The people are the ones we're supposed to be ministering to. But boy, if I could just get away from all the people for just a moment and just be alone. And, and do you think that's what God wants? You think God wants you just to be in a, in a, in a little room without any, any, any exposure to anybody? How are we going to preach the gospel to people if there's no people? Now, there's a time and a place for respite, right? There's a time and a place to, 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 to come aside and rest a while. Jesus told his disciples that in Mark 6. Come aside and rest a while, right? Sometimes you have to just kind of, kind of, kind of uh, decompress. But you have to remember, there are no people over there. 
We need to have compassion. Charles Spurgeon said this. I just love this. He says, I believe that much of the secret of soul winning lies in having bowels of compassion and having spirits that can be touched with the feelings of human infirmities. Having compassion on people. When you walk by them, it's just not a burden. It's just not a client. It's not a customer. It's a person who needs to be saved. They need the Lord. People need the Lord. And I will tell you this, that the more impersonal, the more detached our society becomes, the less compassion we have on people. You know, it's funny, you look at Facebook, and a lot of times there's not even a face. <laughs> it's just an inanimate object with a name, and not even a bio. There's nothing there to identify. It's just a, it's just a they're not even a person. And, and we, we, we remove ourselves from Facebook, and, or with Facebook, and with Twitter, and Instagram, and we just kind of hibernate for a while, because we don't want to be around people, because people are problems. And, and unless they're a customer or a client that adds value to my life, I don't want to be around them. And that is a serious problem. We have less compassion because people aren't real anymore. And problems aren't real. And eternity becomes not so real anymore. So Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus was also moved with conviction. Look at your verse sheets, Matthew 9, 37. Matthew 9, 37. Jesus was moved with conviction. Then said he, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Here we see a great need. The laborers are few. John, John 4, uh, 35 says, Say not ye, there are, four, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. There was a great need. The harvest was ready. There were souls that needed to be saved. And what he's, this is uh, back then a very ag uh, agrarian culture. And, and you can imagine being in Iowa, you look out at these fields and you see these fields that become kind of white. And, and you know what that tells the farmer? It's ready. It's ready to harvest. And that's the message in John that he's trying to explain that the fields are white unto harvest. Today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, or 6, 2. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And we shouldn't waste any time telling people about the gospel message because it's today. Today is the day of salvation. We need to go out there. We need to win them today. That's what, it's, that's what the, the whole goal is. There is a, a dying world out there that we need to tell about a living Savior. And so many times we try to confine ourselves to, to this kind of remoteness or, 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 or maybe trying to be kind of somewhat recluse and we don't want to get out there. But now we got to go out there and we got to be creative and innovative and, and we got to figure out ways to reach people with the gospel. Because the fields are wide unto harvest. Because today is the day of salvation. And there will come a day when you can no longer work the work that you can now. So now we have to go out there and we need to tell people about this great need. The conviction that Jesus had was this, that there is a great need for those who know the greatest need. And you know what that is? It's time to harvest. It's time to go out there and, and, uh, and harvest the grain. The problem is not with the amount of work. It never has been. 2,000 years later, it's not with the amount of work. It's with the amount of workers. There's not enough people to go out there and do all the, all the combining, right? Plenty of fields out there, but there's not enough combines. There's not enough people to run the combines to go out there and harvest the fields. This is the great need. And Jesus saw that there was this great need for additional workers. There was a kind of an unemployment problem, if you will. There's all this work that needed to be done and not enough workers to do it. Let me give you just a little application, because this should be very sobering to us. 
This should be very, very sobering to us. Howard Hendricks said this. He said, a, a belief is something you will argue about. A conviction is something you will die for. And how many times do we find ourselves arguing with, within the church, within religion, but we don't really have conviction about it? Now, Jesus had tremendous conviction. Jesus died for his conviction. He knew that he was going to bring eternal life into this world for those who believe in him. And he died for it. And the question is, is do you have that same conviction for the gospel? Do you have the same kind of conviction that Jesus had? And there are probably things in your life you have conviction about. Maybe political issues, moral issues, and things of that nature. And I think we ought to have conviction about those things. I really do. But do you have conviction about the gospel? You know, ironically, ironically, Jesus is not asking us to die for the gospel. He did that. He's asking us to live for it. He's asking us to, for our lives to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12, right? This is reasonable. He's not asking something unreasonable for, of us. He just says, go out there and proclaim the gospel message. Tell people that I love them and I died for their sin and that through faith alone they can go to heaven. Sounds pretty simple. Do we have that type of conviction? Because Jesus was moved not just with compassion, he was moved with conviction, but he was also moved with concern. Matthew 9, 38. Pray ye therefore... Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We saw that Jesus was moved with conviction and who saw the great need. Now we see a great plead. Here we see a great plead. We, there is a tremendous workload, and we need workers, and we need to pray that God would send forth people to help with this project, project of winning the world with the gospel. Now, if you're a Christian sitting in this room right now, uh, did you realize that you, there, there is more to your life as a Christian than, than just uh, status quo Christianity, not sharing your faith? If you're in this room right now, you have been commissioned with a great commission to go out and proclaim the gospel message to people. Listen, friends, you don't need to do anything to become a Christian, but there's a whole lot more in being a Christian than just being silent. It's going out there and telling people about the wonderful message of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sin. It's funny, when I was a, as a kid, I worked at a, at a Chinese restaurant. That's where I fell in love with Chinese food. <laughs> I was brought into it at a young age. I was 13 years old, and I worked uh, at times 40 hours a week. Now, when I, when I worked at this Chinese restaurant, I, I thought I was the dishwasher. <laughs> there was a whole lot more to that job. Now, I was signed on as a dishwasher, and I remember washing dishes till my skin turned pruney. You know where it takes hours for the wrinkles to go out? You know what I'm talking about? That they, they're like permanent wrinkles? I have them in my face right now. It's called age. But I used to have them in my hands. And, uh, and there was a whole lot more, though, than just washing dishes. I remember I, I made a lot of rice. And uh, what they said, it was, and this, I mean, no disrespect to the Chinese people. I love them to death. But more right, Joe. More right. More right. Which means more rice, Joe. <laughs> it means let's go, right? So uh, I made a ton of rice. I, I have made more rice than you can possibly imagine. And uh, I just made that rice. And then it was, more right, Joe, more right. I'm like, what are these people just, the whole goal is to fill people up on rice. Go to a buffet, just omit the rice. You don't need it. Unless you pour your uh, sweet and sour sauce on your rice and you just eat the rice. Anyway, I also had another job. I also, I also uh, peeled onions, cut onions. Now, you got to remember, at a Chinese restaurant, you don't just peel one onion, okay? I remember there's got to be like some sort of thing like, OSHA or something. I would cry into those onions. And I remember years ago, years ago, we, we went down, we went down south. Where were we? Where we there was a uh, that barbecue place and it kind of was in like the back of a 
I don't know, creepy van. He was horrible. And I remember this guy and, you know, the barbecue down south is, they know what they're doing. Okay, we just try to imitate them. We don't know what we're doing, right? So I, we're down south in Memphis, and, and this guy was literally sweating into the meat that I'm watching him put together. And I remember saying to myself, dear God, I, Lord, I pray for this food. I hope they heated this food. You know, hopefully it killed off. But you could, and that's how it was when I was cut, cutting onions. I'm cutting onions, and I remember it just crying. Anyway. To my knowledge, nobody died from it, so everybody's okay. But nonetheless, there was more to my job than just washing dishes. There was a whole lot more. And when you become a Christian, it's very easy. It's simple faith alone in Jesus' finished work. It's not about work you can do. It's about work he's already done. But being a Christian, there's a, there's a whole lot more. We have a... We have a whole Bible here that tells us about being a Christian. Very few verses about becoming one. That's being born again. That's trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's it. But being a Christian, now that's different. That's different. And so we need to be in God's Word, looking at all of these things that he tells us about being a Christian. But becoming a Christian is very easy. And one of the goals for us is to tell other people about what it takes to become a Christian. And then we need to begin to pray about it. And and we should be praying for souls to be saved, shouldn't we? We should be praying for souls to be saved. We should be praying for power to witness and and for for God's kingdom to be advanced. And that's that's really good for us. We should be doing that. Uh, uh, 2 Peter 3.9, it says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Watch this. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's a change of mind. God is not willing that any should perish. So God's will is that none perish. So if God's will is that, that none should perish, then we can pray that none perish. We can pray for souls. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So the goal is, is to pray for God's will. God's will is that none should perish. We can pray for that, can't we? We can pray for souls to be saved. And we can pray in confidence that God will, in fact, hear our prayers. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I just love my salvation. And I love my Savior who gave it to me. And we could go out, we could just tell people about that. We could tell people about our faith, about what God has done in our lives to save us from the the power and the penalty of sin. It's a wonderful thing. Let me give you just a quick concluding thought, and then we'll have our communion. Here are two ways to share the gospel today. Number one, first of all, be led of God. Be led of God. Uh, Simply that when the Holy Spirit prompts you to tell other people about Christ, just do it, right? Right? When the Lord is pressing in your life to go share your faith with other people, just do it. Don't hold back from that. That is, that is God working in your life. Do you know that? We say, we say to ourselves, why doesn't God work in my life? Why isn't God working? Why isn't there evidence of God's hand moving in my life? And you know what's interesting? Every time that you say no to God when he says to you, share your faith. God was trying to work in your life, and you didn't let him. So number one, be led, be led of God, right? Be led of God, submit, submit to his will. Number two, number two, just real quickly, be in the process of building relationships with others. Be in the process of building relationships with others. You know, that ministry is about relationships. It really is. And just as I had my two boys up here, they're not, they're not just inanimate objects. They're people. And you can build relationships with people. They're not just something. They're a somebody. And the more that we look at people as a relationship, as a person, we'll have compassion on them. And having compassion, we'll have conviction that we need to do something about it.
the goal of the Great Commission is winning people to Jesus Christ, then we should take every opportunity in turning a secular conversation spiritual. Build relationships for the purpose of evangelism because you love them. Friends, we're not preaching religion here. I'm not trying to sell something. We're trying to give something away for free that was given to us. What a wonderful thing to do is just to have, to, to go out there and just, I, I knew a guy who was, I don't know how old Marvin was. He's old. He'd just go, he's, he's really old. He was probably like 70. No. He'd go to the mall. He'd sit down. He'd sit down on his little bench because that's what old guys did, right? They just are people watching. He'd sit down on his bench and, and throw one leg over the other and talk to the neighbor next to him. And he says, so what are you here for? And uh, he wasn't in prison. Sounded like a prison thing, but it's not. He says, hey, what are you here for? He says, oh, just uh, shopping. Be like, oh, yeah, great. You know, just shopping, huh? Boy, a lot of really expensive stuff out there. A lot of free stuff, too. Oh, nothing free here. Yeah, but there's something free in heaven. And he'd sit down, and he would just casually talk to people and says, would you like to know what, what is free in here? Well, man, I'd love to know. I'll take anything that's free. Salvation's free. Where are you going when you die, brother? And he would just go out and he would, for the, for the express purpose of having a spiritual conversation. And another guy, he would go in and go and find someone who's just sitting by himself at McDonald's. He'd look out and see, oh, there's a guy over there. He'd go down and sit down and plop down and set his meal up there and say, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> and begin to talk to him about the gospel. Isn't that neat that you could just do that? And we say, well, but, but I'm, just, I'm just not that bold. We'll try to be. What do you have to lose? Nothing. You have everything to gain. How neat would it be if we turned all of our secular conversations spiritual just by talking to them about the Lord? I find that one of the hardest things as a young Christian is just to express your faith because you're afraid that they're going to ask you a question that you don't have the answer to. And you know what? People do it all the time. They ask me all sorts of questions. We are doing something in Sunday school, and Joel's like, yeah, but Reuben was blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I guess you're right. That's right there in verse 22 or whatever it was. People do it all the time. Big deal. We have something far greater to gain, don't we? So number one is be led of the Spirit. Number two, be in the process of building relationships with other people. You know why? Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know where you're going when you die, the most important truth you can know before you leave this place is not the name of the church, it's not the names of the people, it's the only name that saves, though, and his name is Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth to die on the cross to pay for your sin debt. Isn't that interesting that the wages of sin is death? Someone had to die for this. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. He came to make your payment for you. You know, Jesus was sinless. He didn't have a payment to make of his own. He didn't have uh, this, this debt, this burden for himself. He had the burden for you. That's why he bore the burden. He died in your place. Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. That's all it takes in being a Christian. I should say becoming a Christian. Now what we've been commissioned with because we are a Christian something far greater. Taking the gospel to other people. Sharing the good news. Isn't it interesting the word gospel means good news? Isn't that just wonderful? Sharing the good news with other people. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, it's simply when you place your faith in Christ alone as your Savior. It's when you believe in the quietness of your mind that Jesus died to make the payment for your sin that you owe. And you'll be saved that fast. Trust in Jesus Christ alone today as your Savior.